Uh, the reading is taken from Matthew 12, verses 1 to 14. I can't read it if it's down there. <clears throat> At that time, Jesus went through the cornfields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and he began to pick some ears of corn and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he, his, he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what, those words, what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would, have condemned the, you would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and it was completely restored, just as, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Uh, hello, everyone. Nice to uh, be here with you. Um, some of you might know that although uh, I was born in California, I, I grew up in Pakistan, where I spent my childhood and teenage years. So like many of you, uh, I have family all over the world. And uh, growing up, especially my younger years, we often didn't have a phone. So uh, what that meant is when we were connecting with friends and family, we would have to travel down to a thing called a public call office, uh, or PCO. And uh, I want you to imagine uh, walking down to a local shop, carrying the phone number that you need and cash. Those are two requirements. And the shop owner or person behind the counter uh, dials the number for you. And for those of you under a certain age, the phone is also connected to the wall with a, with a cable. Uh, so you're not going very far. And uh, the, the person listens on the other end. If there's some connection to the, the time zone and the place that you, you want to call, then uh, they pass you the phone, and you get to connect to this person. And it, it really sounds like what it is, a, a pipe under the ocean talking to somebody else. Um, sometimes there's this awkward 20-second delay where you'd really have to time your cadence of your comments to get the, the conversation going, but there's nothing you could really do about it. And I also recall one time another conversation completely cut into the line. So we were hearing this other conversation. They couldn't hear us, but it was going on at the same time as we were having this, this conversation. Anyway, it was very expensive, actually, so the calls are short. No time to listen or ramble or, or just, you know, you, each second costs more rupees, so you just say hello, I love you, goodbye. And today, it's all changed, hasn't it? You know, I just pull up my phone and face-to-face -face call with my brother in Kenya or my sister in the States or my dad in Jordan, and, and right there, face-to-face, -face, a call, a connection, and uh, all of that, and it's practically free, which is also great. But guess what? Something else has changed as well. My expectations of that call have also shifted. So a little buffering or a bit glitchy, a bit pixelated, can't handle it. Switch apps, give up. Uh, it's just annoying <laughs> trying to talk to somebody and not getting that perfect crystal clear uh, connection. So in just a few short years, my entire expectation of what it means to communicate with a loved one has fundamentally shifted. It's kind of an unreasonable expectation change. And in the last few decades, we've seen that primarily through technology, just that incredible change in expectations. And they just keep increasing and increasing, and we get less and less able to handle uh, things not going quite right. I think this video uh, illustrates this experience nicely. Yeah, sorry, I should have given you a warning on the pain of that, actually. It's, uh, I should have 
it can feel a little like that when the reality doesn't match our expectations. Uh, as, as, whether or not our expectations are reasonable or not, or whether our expectations have changed or not, the fact that our expectations aren't being met creates this kind of, you know, I, I, by the way, I have never tried this and will never try this. Um, but it's not all bad, right? There are some things we shouldn't be, uh, uh, you know, we should be expecting more. There are some things we shouldn't tolerate. It's not simply that our expectations are, are getting unreasonable. But whether reasonable or not, the fact is, uh, when our expectations are met, we just simply get frustrated or even angry, sometimes righteously angry. You know, bad service in a restaurant, two stars. Uh, climbing an escalator and no one stand, people not standing on the right, tourists. And uh, maybe slighted by a colleague or ignored by your boss, let me tell you all about it. So here we are in Matthew 12, and we get to see the expectations of the Pharisees collide with Jesus. Remember who the Matthew is writing to. The primary audience for Matthew's account is his fellow Jews. And he's making the case that the long-awaited, long-prophesied Messiah is coming. And this is him. He's arrived. This is who they've been waiting for. He is the fulfillment of the scriptures. So this audience that's reading and, or, or listening to Matthew at the time, they're expectant. Right? They're expectant that one day the Messiah is coming to save them and to rescue them. And they're also faithful, carrying the tradition of their ancestors, uh, observing uh, the rules and the f uh, rooted in the faith and practice of, of previous generations. But as we can see here, they're also burdened by them too, burdened by the tradition, burdened by the religion. It's hard to know sometimes what is scripture and what is culture. It's hard to know sometimes what is God's word and where the traditions have gotten all wrapped up into them. So let's talk a little bit about that expectation of the Sabbath. Uh, it all started at the beginning, right? At the beginning of the Bible, we get uh, the Genesis account of creation. And here we see God very busy creating things, right? So there's this beautiful sing-song cadence of God speaking a word, creating something new, looking at it, closing the day, starting the day, speaking a word, creating something new, and closing the day, and so on, until he breaks the pattern. On the seventh day, we read, he blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work he had done in creation. This is the point where God stops to celebrate and enjoy what he has created to revel in it, to dwell in the goodness, and to see it continues on. There's no end to that day in the Genesis story. Judith Shulovitz is a writer and advocate for Sabbath rest, and she uh, gives us a wonderful picture. She likens the Sabbath to a frame, uh, a frame around a piece of art. So if you're looking at a wall, the frame tells you that the thing inside that frame is worth looking at. And it is in that space that frame points our eye towards God's work and all the good he has done. And that is what we get in Genesis. But our next significant Sabbath moment is Exodus, and that's the uh, story of Moses and the Ten Commandments. So just let's remember where we are. The Jews are in the wilderness, but they are free. They are no longer slaves in Egypt. And they're contending with their place and trying to figure it out. They're headed towards uh, the promised land, uh, but it will be another generation before they, they make it there. So God gives them some laws to live by. So let's do a quick recap. Uh, one, what's the first ten of the Ten Commandments? You shall have no other gods before me. Two, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or, or worship anything in creation. Three, you shall not take the name of God in vain or use his name for what is uh, not true or right. And four, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you should labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall, do, you shall not do any work. So that's when it becomes the law, the prepared for, established, and honored tradition every week, a day marked holy. But I want to call your attention to just a few years after this Exodus passage in the book of Deuteronomy. Um, this is when uh, the Jews are actually going into the promised land, uh, led by Joshua, and Moses is not going with them, but he uh, recaps a lot of, uh, of the Exodus uh, story, and he, he goes through the Ten Commandments again, and he frames it slightly differently. Here's how he frames the Fourth Commandment. 
after saying it's the, it's the day when you, when you won't do all your work, and et cetera, he says, you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there, and, and don't miss this, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. In other words, don't ever forget that you were captives and God got you out of there. That's the message translation. I just love that. So, we're re recapping here. As we come back to these two Sabbath stories in Matthew 12, here's what we know. God is Lord of the Sabbath. God blesses the seventh day, not just as a recharge, but as a celebration of his goodness. So it's the climax of the week to enjoy what is good. And third, he wants us to remember that we were once captives, but we are free. He wants us to remember what he has done for us and provided for us. So by the time we get to this passage in Matthew, people expect the Sabbath to be a holy day of rest, of absolute rest. But in fact, a lot of other oral traditions, uh, uh, the Mishnah, have, have helped clarify some of those do's and don'ts. So we have a few more rules, a few more understanding of what the Sabbath should be, what's prohibited, what's mandated uh, for the rule followers amongst us. I think that actually sounds pretty good. I know what I'm supposed to do and not supposed to do on the day. Uh, but when we get to this passage, uh, and let's go through it now, verse by verse, uh, just keep in mind uh, that, uh, uh, that, that this is where we have come to. So here we are. It's the Sabbath day, and Jesus and his disciples are strolling through a field, picking grain and snacking as they go. I'm a big snacker. I love to snack. And the Pharisees, are, are, they're not happy about this. This is not good news for them. Uh, it just doesn't meet their expectations of what is acceptable on this day. Uh, it isn't lawful, they say. They're annoyed. They are frustrated. They're frustrated with Jesus, and they're frustrated with the whole situation. And Jesus does something very interesting. He, he doesn't respond with a, yes, it is, it's fine. He comes back with a reframing of the Sabbath through the scriptures. The Pharisee is very knowledgeable about what, what, what he's pointing out. And he points out that the hero David bent or even broke the law in a time of need. And that priests themselves actually work on the Sabbath, which is lawful, but they are still innocent. And then he says something just incredible. I love this. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You have not understood this, he says. It's an incredible statement, reestablishing the entire order of things. It's, it's a complete shift in perspective away from uh, inward-looking uh, re religious <laughs> weight towards that outward-facing servant-heartedness, uh, a resetting of, of, of God, what God is and what God requires of us. But in case you missed it, this I desire, uh, pointing to himself, uh, he, Jesus makes absolutely sure that the Pharisees get it and doubles down and says, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. I am God, he is saying. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And as you can imagine, the Pharisees really do not like that at all. <laughs> not one bit. Next, we find ourselves in the synagogue. So the Pharisees believe uh, that life-saving healing is allowed, but not much more than that. So they try to bait Jesus. They try to catch him out. They're keen to show him as a rebel, as a lawbreaker. And so, again, Jesus tries to reset their expectations, to try to reframe them. Would they risk losing their own livelihood or a possession, uh, of, a possession of value to this mandate, to this law? And he wonders... Would you follow that law all the way to the letter, even sacrificing a lamb? That's called foreshadowing, by the way, in storytelling. Uh, verse 12, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath, he declares. And I, I love this positive framing. Thank you for the, uh, 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 mentioning the encouragement, Emily. I, I, I do love to encourage. And I love this, uh, this framing. It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. That, that's about restoration and goodness and health. It's not about denial or abolishing or taking away, and I, I just, I, that just warms my heart. And he turns to this man in distress, and in the translation we read, shriveled hand or withered hand, and, said, and simply speaks, stretch out your hand. And the man holds out his hand, and he is healed. And I, I don't want you to miss this, because we spent, just rattled through the Old Testament on the Sabbath very briefly, but it's very, very evocative this language that, that is happening here. So first of all, remember, God in Genesis speaks and creation comes through. And it's the same thing here. Jesus speaks and there's restoration. 
And the second thing is in Deuteronomy, that passage I read, uh, and I'll just remind you, you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. There is just, it, this is just unbelievable uh, storytelling, this moment of, of, of spectacular <laughs> healing and redemption. And believe me, the Pharisees, they must see this. They must get a whiff, a whiff of this. They're so rooted in the scripture. They must understand the symbolism at some level. Uh, and certainly Matthew is reveling in it. And in this moment, can you believe it? The Pharisees, they're struck with their hearts, their hearts warmed. They respond with awe. They fall at the knees of Jesus and they declare, yes, this must be God, the long-awaited Messiah, the great hope, the creator, the healer. He is finally here. No, that's not what they do at all. They storm out, they're furious, and they're plotting his destruction. I don't know if you have ever planned to kill somebody, but that is quite, quite something, quite something. When Martin originally uh, asked me to, to preach uh, this Sunday, and I saw the topic, I, uh, I had to laugh. Uh, it, it couldn't be, not the Sabbath. Honestly, I'm terrible at resting. Uh, that, that is a very difficult thing for me. I, 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 in fact, I think I can be pretty difficult to be around uh, when I'm resting. I have both my eldest daughter and my, my wife here, so I'm not gonna look at them in this section. But when the pace slows, and the adrenaline and the purpose and the passion of the week kind of collide with the weekend, uh, I, I think that's not, <laughs> not the best time for me. Uh, the, the moments of quiet can be a, a time of, of, uh, of yeah, negative energy, and in truth, preparing this talk has been quite convicting, and, and I, I just want to share with you, this is my experience of the Sabbath. If it is the Lord's day, I have to confess that I am overcommitted, I am distracted, and I walk into the weekend expecting rest and generally falling flat on my face uh, without my expectations having been met, not preparing for it, not planning for it, and just blundering through. And honestly, again, I have spent weeks and weeks in this passage, and an unexpected thing has happened. First, I have found Jesus more and more unbelievable, <laughs> but I have also uh, started to feel a bit of sympathy for the Pharisees. Uh, yes, they had forgotten who was Lord of the Sabbath, and I have to assume that started from a good place originally. Um, I don't know if you're a rule breaker or a rule follower, but I have to imagine those who painstakingly kind of categorized uh, what was in and what was out on the Sabbath started from a place of, let's just make it clear. And I, I think it really did represent the right heart to cultivate that atmosphere of rest it takes a bit of planning, takes a bit of work. But the Pharisees had become captive to those rules and regulations. They had forgotten the heart of the Sabbath. It's not what they expected, and they were really angry about it. So I want to ask you, what is your expectation of the Sabbath today? What is the gap between your expectation and reality? I, I think it's unhelpful to take this passage in Matthew and simplistically declare that the Sabbath uh, rules no longer apply to us. I, I think that's a little dismissive. But I also think it's not very helpful just to reiterate this kind of uh, rules and regulations and burden us with that. Um, it's very clear, though, that the Sabbath is important to God. And it is very clear that it is for our good. Now, I, we live in a time where the wealth of literature and podcasts and, and are pouring out on rest and recovery and space and amazing content, uh, secular and, and Christian, just, I think, shows that maybe our culture is hunger, hungering for something ancient and profound. Um, and I think if Jesus was here today, I, I do wonder what he would say to us. It's hard to imagine the snacking story and, and this religiousness coming into play, but I do imagine his concern might be around maybe our relentless distraction and maybe our persistent consumption uh, and a lack of any space uh, really around the edges. And I do wonder if we are too busy to pause and remember what God has done for us maybe too preoccupied to plan ahead a little bit and prepare a day of rest, um, and too tied up to remember he has set us free. Uh, I asked myself a few questions. I'll ask them collectively if you don't mind, but they really were for me. Uh, are we so overscheduled that we miss connecting with each other in the margins? 
Are we so industrious that we cannot give our planet a day of rest from our craving to consume? Are we too distracted to see others need for outstretched hands? Uh, studies have shown that when we are rushed or hurried, it can actually shut down our ability to see those in distress. Uh, and actually, busyness can even dull our empathy, uh, especially for strangers, but also for uh, friends and family and even ourselves. And I think this rise in popularity of Sabbath practices is a good thing. Uh, you know, uh, the spiritual disciplines are a good thing to, to remind ourselves, as long as they don't become uh, religious rituals themselves. Uh, without the cross, there is no freedom uh, in, in this. And they, them, they, they, they are very important, but they don't bring the freedom and the space themselves. It is the cross and Jesus who is the Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, and it is and always will be the cross that sets us free. But uh, as Paul writes in Romans 14, what is important is that if you keep a holy day, keep it for God's sake. We belong to God, he alone is judge. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. So then I ask, what is your expectation of Jesus? What is the gap between your expectation and the reality of your experience? And I, I don't know how you are tonight, how you really are. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would ask you to ask later today, how are you? I would ask you to ask, how are you really? And see what that answer is. Maybe you're tired, burned out even, uh, burned out on religion. Are you sick? Are you sick and tired of things? Are you worried? Are you worried about tomorrow? Are you withered? Are you feeling broken? Are you in need of healing? Are you lost? Are you alone? Are you frustrated? Are you frustrated with yourself or with others? Are you overworked or underworked? Overcommitted or non-committal? Are you unemployed? Distracted? Are you bored? Are you in danger? Are you too busy? Are you too busy worrying about what others are doing or, or not doing? Are you so sure of something that you're actually irritated with God that he's not showing up? And, and showing up the way you want him to? Listen, un unlike the tough reality that bursts the bubble of our expectations, I want to tell you something. Jesus is the other way around. I, I think the Pharisees' expectation, indeed the disciples' expectation, and I believe ours, was and is just a pale reflection of what Jesus really is, the real reality of Jesus. And... Um, if you recall, if you were here last week, uh, Martin preached on the chapter just before this, chapter 11, and um, the, the verses that immediately precede this two Sabbath stories are really important. I'm going to read the message version of this uh, uh, just to remind you. So it says in, in the end of chapter 11, come to me, this is Jesus speaking, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I will show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you will learn to live freely and lightly. Watch how I do it, says Jesus. Uh, David was desperate, hungry, and on the run. God provided food, a moment of kindness, and safety. The disciples were hungry and had little means. God provided grain and that community. The man in the synagogue was in need of help, and God helped him, healed him. Watch how I do it, said Jesus. <laughs> we expect sacrifice, but he pours out mercy. We require rules, and he gives us release. We are heavy laden, but he heals us. Uh, we, we think about what we deserve, and he offers us gift after gift after gift. We, we work for ourselves, and, and he shows us the value in serving others. Uh, we carry that burden of, of religion, 
and he gives us rest for our souls. Condemnation replaced by kindness. Uh, Inflexible rituals replaced by flexible hearts. Uh, Dimly lit expectations replaced by broad daylight reality. I, I, I cannot believe this God, this Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus. And I, for one, want to watch how he does it. I want to learn to live freely and lightly and to the full. And I believe that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And what greater reality can we have than that. Um, I want to ask you to stand as we pray. Father God, help us reset our expectations of you. We want to listen to your word. We want to hear you speak, and we dare to expect more. Help us to learn those unforced rhythms of grace. Help us to delight in you and your great, great goodness. You are so good. And in your name, we place our hope. Amen.